John tells us that the name Babylon emblazoned on the woman's forehead is preceded by the word mystery. And again, mystery is the very heart of Roman Catholicism. Pope Paul well, this video is about the transubstantiation, which is the mystery of the bread being the body of Christ and uh, the wine being the, the blood of Christ. And uh, Dave Hunt rightfully puts a lot of arguments forward, but I really think he misses the elephant in the room, which, uh, in fact, the whole Catholic Mass is not about the true Messiah, it's about the Antichrist. I'm sure he would agree with me. Um, but... Uh, it, you know, it doesn't really challenge the obvious, which we will look at two or three Catholic masses and see what they actually say. If they're actually, uh, you know, if it actually represents Jesus Christ or it represents Lucifer. By claiming to be the custodian of a mystery which only its priests and bishops can mediate, the Roman Catholic Church keeps its members dependent upon it rather than upon Christ for their salvation. John notes that the woman on the beast is clothed in purple and scarlet. Once again, the very colors of the Roman Caesars and also of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. The Catholic Encyclopedia declares cassock, also called soutane, the close fitting ankle length robe worn by the Catholic clergy as their official garb, the color for bishops and other prelates is purple for cardinals scarlet the woman riding the beast has a golden cup in her hand a golden chalice is used in the eucharist or mass and is the holiest instrument in roman catholicism john perceives that this golden chalice is filled with quote the filthiness of her abominations unquote could that be the bible's view of the sacrifice of the mass which is the very heart of Roman Catholicism. With great pomp, fanfare, and ceremony, Pope Francis, the head of the Jesuit order, announced through his cantor the eminent emergence, the near advent of the coming to light of the Antichrist. I mean, you can hear that very, very clearly. A lot of Catholics are known for drinking and, well, sinning. <laughs> um, the Bible says that my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. Um, now, the Catholic Church have been doing this in front of masses, performing the mass in front of masses for a long, long time feeding this body of the Antichrist to its members for a long, long time, which uh, spiritually is like a harlot to God. That's what it looks like, you know, from heaven. This, this is what this, this whole thing is. That's the blasphemy right there. Christ, Lucifer's son, every single Catholic Mass. Yeah, I mean, again, people who haven't read the Bible, Isaiah fourteen twelve, and other scriptures talk about a fallen cherub named Lucifer, who is Satan, who is the like the dragon. In the book of Revelation, you know this is uh, the one who tries to set himself up as God and be worshipped as God, just like these people are doing. During this pronouncement, the cantor called Lucifer God claiming Lucifer to be the father of Jesus Christ. The cantor acknowledged Lucifer as the Antichrist himself and worshipped him. To this, 
a great crowd and the whole world sang. This was the 3D ceremony that the Pope wanted to be seen worldwide. The announcement to the world, the son of perdition, this way comes. So uh, Dave Hunt, you know, touches on a lot of things, but really misses this uh, very, very obvious thing that they've been doing for quite a while. You know, these guys are the Illuminati. That's who they are. Or Illuminati, <laughs> which is the Latin. Here's another one. I mean, just makes you completely sick. Totally sick, doesn't it? And uh, let's hear a little quick testimony of uh, an ex-nun, just in case you're not convinced that the Catholic Church is uh, basically the Church of Satan. It's been the, the Church of Satan for the past 1700 years. Was that the part they're meant to be saying, you know, Christos? They don't even say Jesus. And so, you know, it's the Antichrist they're talking about in Latin. That's what they're saying. Entered the convent as a small child. I went on to school, but they were, I was being trained. But the day came, uh, possibly I was 14 and a half, when the Mother Superior began to tell me about the white veil. And I didn't know too much about it. Uh, but taking the white veil, they told me that I would become the spouse or the bride of Jesus Christ. There would be a ceremony. And I would be dressed in a wedding garment. And uh, on this particular morning, uh, they told me at 9 o'clock, uh, they would dress me up in a wedding garment. Now, you're wondering uh, where that come from and how they get the wedding clothes for the little nuns. The mother superior sits down and writes a letter to my father and tells him how much money she wants. And then, um, whatever she asks, my father sends it, and she, the little buying sister, goes out and buys uh, the material, and the uh, uh, wedding gown is made by the nuns of the cloister. I'm still open order now. And, of course, whatever she asks, now you say, did they spend all the money for the wedding gown? Well, of course, we don't know these things in the very beginning of our testimony, but after we live in a convent for a little while, we learn to know they could ask my father for $100, and he'd send it. And uh, oh, not, they wouldn't use maybe a third of that for the wedding garment. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, uh, just as the the body of Christ that's, that's represented in the Catholic Church is corrupt, and it's definitely the Antichrist uh, body that you're taking there. As Catholic, sorry to say that, if you are a Catholic, but uh, yeah, and I've visited one or two in the past in a very demonic presence. But sadly, there's a lot of women who join the Catholic Church with good intent, um, as she's describing here, not just uh, runaway um, girls and stuff like that, or um, women with uh, girls with behavioral difficulties, but people who genuinely, um, you know, want to serve Christ as, as, as they understand him. They don't know the gospel. She, this woman later on got saved. But uh, we can hear some of the sacraments that go on in the Catholic Church. Uh, very surprising um, for a lot of people. But they would keep the rest of it. My father would never know the difference. Neither did I until I lived in the convent for a period of time. And I had to make some of the wedding clothes. And then I knew the value of them and what they cost. And I knew of the money that came in because I was one of the older nuns. 
Well, all right, the time came, of course, when I walked down that aisle and I was dressed in a wedding garment. Now, you know, in the uh, convent, I used to walk the 14th of Christ meant to be across the 14th the and carry really. across the Calvary. But after I had made up my mind to take the white veil, never again did I walk. I wanted to be worthy. I wanted to be holy enough to become the spouse or the bride of Jesus Christ. And so I would get out on my knees and crawl the 14 stations. It was quite a distance. But I crawled them every Friday morning. I felt it would make me holy. I felt it would draw me closer to God. It would make me worthy of the step that I was going to take. And I mean, people may laugh at this, but, you know, this is religion. This is what religious people do. They think that through their works, um, you know, that they can uh, impress God or that they can somehow please God. Um, but, you know, it's dead works according to the, the scriptures. She doesn't know this yet. But the initiation here is, is extremely satanic. That's what I wanted more than anything in the world. I would like to impress on your heart every little girl that enters the convent that I know anything about. That child has a desire to live for God. That child has a desire to give her heart, mind, and soul to God. Now, many, many people make this remark, and we hear it from uh, various uh, types of folk who say only bad women go into convents. That isn't true. There are movie stars who go into convents. They've lived out in the world, no doubt they are sinners and all of that. But they go in when they're women, they know what they're doing. And they go in only because the Roman Catholic Church is going to receive not only thousands, but yeah, it'll run up into the millions of dollars. And they don't mind who they take in if they can get a lot of money out of that. The ordinary little girl that goes in as a child, she's just a child, and she goes in there with a heart and mind and soul just as clean as any child could be. I, I say that because sometimes we hear a lot of things that are really not true. Now, after we become the spouse of Jesus Christ, I want you to listen carefully to this, and then you can follow me into the rest of the testimony. We are now looked upon as married women. We are looked upon as married women. We are the spouse or the bride of Jesus Christ. Now, the priest teaches every little girl that will take the white veil, they'll become the bride of Christ. He teaches her to believe that her family will be saved. It doesn't make any difference how many banks they rob, how many stores they rob. It doesn't make any difference how they drink and smoke and carouse and live out in, in this sinful world and do all the things that sinners do. It doesn't make a bit of difference. Still, our family will be saved if we continue to live in the convent and give our lives to the convent or to the church. Uh, we can rest assured that every member of our immediate family will be saved. And you know there are many of little children that are influenced and enticed to go into convents because we realize it is a salvation for our families. And sometimes, even Roman Catholic families, the children grow up and leave the Roman Catholic Church and go out into the deepest of sin. And so every little girl that enters a convent is hoping by her sacrificing so much, home and loved ones, mother and daddy, everything that a child loves, her family will be saved regardless of what sins they commit. And of course we're children and our minds are immature and we don't know any better. And it's so easy to instill things like this into the hearts and minds of little children. And the priest is a really, he's really good at it. And of course we look upon our priest, our father confessor, I looked upon him as God. He's the only God I knew anything about. And to me he was infallible. Looked upon him as God. I mean that's, uh, talk about a cult. You know, talk about a mega cult. And that's what the Catholic Church is. Well, I didn't think he could sin. I didn't think that he would lie. I didn't think that he ever made a mistake. I looked upon him as the holiest of holy because I didn't know a God, but I did know the Roman Catholic priest. And to me, I, I, I looked to him uh, for everything that I asked uh, of any of God, so to speak. I believed the priest could give it to me. And so the day comes when oh, all of us. Now, as we're going in, I want you to listen carefully. After taking the white veil, things are beautiful. I'm 16 and a half years of age. Everyone's good to me. And uh, I'm living in the convent, and I haven't seen anything yet. Because no little girl, we are not subject to a Roman Catholic priest until we're 21 years of age. And as we give you this next vow, then you'll understand that we don't know about this. This is kept from the little sisters until we take our black veil, and then it's too late. I, I don't carry the keys to those double doors, and there's no way for me to come out. The priest will uh, tell all over the whole United States and other countries that sisters or nuns, rather, can walk out of convicts when they want to. I spent 22 years there. I did everything there was to do to get out. I've carried tablespoons with me into the dungeons and tried to dig down into that dirt because there's no floors in those places. But I never yet found myself digging far enough to get out of a convent with a tablespoon, and that's about the only instrument. Because when we're using the spade, and we do have to do hard, heavy work, when we use a spade, we're being guarded, we're being watched. 
uh, by two older nuns, and they're going to report on it. And I'll assure you, you're not going to try to dig out with a spade, and you wouldn't get very far. So what she's saying is, is that um, nuns who are in there, and they make these vows, and it's a blood covenant, which she'll explain in a second, which is satanic. But there's no way out of there. It's really a concentration camp. Uh, that, that's exactly what it is. It's a concentration camp, a legal concentration camp. Far anyway, because they built, made those convents or built those convents, so little nuns cannot escape. That was their purpose in building them as they build them. And there's no way for us to get out unless God makes a way. But I believe God's making a way for numbers of little girls after they come out of the convent. All right, now when the time comes, I think I was 18 when the mother began talking to me. Now, I planned to come out, see, after my wife failed. I wanted to be a little nursing sister in the Roman church. But the mother superior, I suppose she was watching my life. I suppose she realized I had much endurance. I had a strong body. And I believe the woman was watching me because one day she asked me to come into her office and she began to tell me, Charlotte, you have a strong body. And she said, I believe you have uh, the uh, possibilities of making a good nun. A cloister done. I believe you're the type that would be willing to give up home, give up mother and daddy, give up everything you love out in the world, and the world, so to speak, and hide yourself away behind convent doors, because I believe you're the kind who would hide back there and be willing to sacrifice and live in crucial poverty, that you might pray for lost humanity. She said, I believe you're the kind who'd be willing to suffer, because we are taught to believe as nuns, that we, as we suffer, our loved ones and your loved ones, that are already in a priest purgatory will be delivered from purgatory sooner because of our suffering. And of course, purgatory is a false doctrine. Uh, it's just not in the Bible. It's made up to, you know, as another sacrament, as a way of escaping God's judgment um, and refusal to, you know, accept the true Messiah. She knew I was willing to suffer. I didn't murmur. I didn't complain. She knew all of that, and she's watching my life, and that's the reason she began to tell me about the black veil. And then, of course, you know, I didn't know too much about a cloistered nun. I, I didn't know their life. I didn't know how they live. I didn't know what they'd done. But, you know, this woman proceeded to tell me. Now, I hear a lot of people uh, try to tell me in the various places that we travel and go. I hear a lot of Roman Catholics try to tell me I've been in so many cloisters. I know all about them. But, you know, a Roman Catholic can lie to you, and they don't have to go to confession and tell the priest about the lie that they told because they're lying to protect their faith. They can tell any lie they want to to protect their faith and never go to the confessional box and tell the priest about it. They can do more than that. They can steal up to $40, and they don't have to tell the priest about it. They don't have to say one word about it in the confessional box. They are taught that. Every Roman Catholic knows it, and every Roman Catholic can be horrified to know how many of them steal up to that amount. And many of them lie. We've dealt with them. I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of them. I've seen a good many of them fall into the altar and cry out to God to save them. And you know, before they're saved, they look into my face and hold my hand and lie to me. But after God gets a hold of their heart, then they want to make right what they've told me because they realize they've lied about it. But as long as they're Roman Catholic, they're permitted to lie. And it's a sad thing. And uh, you can't expect them to know God because God doesn't uh, does not condone sin. With them, I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of them. I've seen good many of them fall into the altar and cry out to God to save them. And you know, before they're saved, they look into my face and hold my hand and lie to me. But after God gets a hold of their heart, then they want to make right what they've told me because they realize they've lied about it. But as long as they're Roman Catholic, they're permitted to lie, and it's the saddest thing, and uh, you can't expect them to know God because God doesn't uh, does not condone sin. I don't care who you are, but I don't believe God condones sin, and I don't believe he's going to condone it to the Roman Catholic people, even though they're being misled and they're being blinded and led in the ways that's going to lead them into uh, a devil's hell. So again, you know, just Catholics follow the catechism, which is commandments of men so they're told that they can do white lies they're told um, just like the Muslims that they can lie a little bit to sort of defend their faith and stuff not good enough it's not good enough um, lies is lies in the Bible and it'll be punished it's, it's a sin punishable um, by you know eternal death you know a liar uh, will um, go to the lake of fire according to the Bible. Here it is, Revelation 21 8. Cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. Their portion 
will be in the lake that burns with sulfur, which is the second death. No coming back from that. Jews in the death camps, you know, just took their gold away, took their money away, put them into the death camps. But this religion, this Catholic religion, is so satanic, so brainwashing that it's uh, convincing people to do it willingly. Everything as a little girl growing up in that home, I remember. 
remembered it, laying in that casket, knowing I'll never hear her voice again, I'll never see her face again, I'll never put my feet under her table again, enjoy her good cooking. I knew all that, and so maybe for four hours I spilled all the tears in my body because it was so hard, and I knew I'd get homesick, I knew I'd want to see her someday, but I gave it all up. What for? For the love of God, I thought I didn't know any better. And I'll assure you, those were nine long hours. And then I seemingly got a hold of myself, and I thought, this, Charlotte, now you're going to make the best Carmelite nun, because everything I've ever done, even that I'm out of the convent, I do give my best. I try... It's like nine hours in a casket wearing a funeral dress, and this is uh, how you join a, <clears throat> a convent. It's very interesting. It doesn't sound very Christian to me. I'll never legally marry in this world because I'm the spouse of Christ. And then after this, the Mother Superior leads me out into another room, or rather she opens the door, and I'm to be sent into that room. And when I walk out in that room, I see something I have never seen before. I see a Roman Catholic priest dressed in a holy habit. And he walks over to me and locks his arm in my arm, which he had never done in the first part of my convent life. I never had a priest to insult me in any way. I never had one other to be even unkind to me in the first part of my convent experience. But here he is now, and of course I didn't understand what it was all about. And I didn't know what in the world of the man really expected of me. And you know, I pulled from him because I felt highly insulted. And I pulled from him and I said, shame on you. And it made him very angry for a minute. He said, uh, immediately, the mother superior must have heard my voice because she came out immediately. And she said, oh, and they called me by my church name. She said, after you've been in the convent, in a little while, you won't feel this way. The rest of us felt the same way you do. And you know, the priest's body is sanctified. And therefore, it is not a sin for us to give uh, the priest our bodies. In other words, they teach every little nun this. As the Holy Ghost placed the germ in Mary's womb, and Jesus Christ was born, so the priest is the Holy Ghost. And therefore, it isn't a sin for us to bear his children. And well, there you go. It's a bit of a step there, isn't it? She's made, and uh, she doesn't realize what she's done. Obviously, a you know a, a sweet girl, you know, thinking she's given her, devoting her life to serve God, and never heard the gospel, um, never had an encounter with the Lord, which she she later does, but she goes through rape and torture, in that um, coven. So that's what it is. It's, it's just a witch's coven, really, uh, with sorcerers there as the priests. No different from a from a satanic coven, and uh, these women are raped and tortured uh, for the next twenty years until she finally escapes. Um, quite a testimony. Just think of all the other women who are going through what she's gone through. The many millions, possibly, of women throughout the centuries who've um, had to go through this, had to endure this. But and I walked along beside the Mother Superior. When I got near the front, I saw those little candles burning. Anywhere in the convent, you'll find the seven candles burning. And when I came a little closer, I saw the candles, but I couldn't see anything else, and I wondered what she's going to do to me. That's the thing in our hearts, and we can't get away from it because we have fear. And when I come a little closer, I saw uh, something lying on a board there. And you know, when I came real close, then I realized, here's a little nun lying on that board. I call it a cooling board because it was that and I just as long as her body, and there she was, and when I could see where the candles flickered down on her face, I realized that child is dead. And oh, I wanted so much to say, how did she die? Why is she here? How long do you keep her here? But you remember, I signed away every human right, and so I can't say one word, but I stood looking. Then the mother said, a superior, a superior said, you stand vigil over this dead body for one hour, and at the end of the hour, a little bell is tapped, and another nun will come to relieve me. And may I say, I was advised ever so many minutes, I have to walk out in the front of that little body and sprinkle holy water and ashes over the body and say, peace be unto you. And I did exactly what they told me to do. Oh, it was a terrible feeling. I'm not afraid of the dead. It's the life people we have to be very cautious about. And I wasn't afraid of that little dead nun, but oh, my heart ached for. And, uh, you know, after the bell tapped and I realized my hour's gone, the nun who comes to relieve us comes back here somewhere. And she, of course, we walk on our tiptoes. No noise is made in the convent. And when they don't speak, they just touch you. And, of course, by being down there with that little dead nun, and I was full of fear, when that girl laid a hand on my shoulder, I let out a scream, a horrible scream, from fear, just fear. And, you know, I, did, I, I didn't mean to do it. 
I didn't break that rule on purpose, but I was scared. And immediately, uh, of course, I had to come before the mother superior. And you can't really blame her, can you? But she gets tortured for that for nine days. Nine, strung up for nine days by her thumbs, she gets for that uh, outburst. Is of 800 babies have been discovered buried in a septic tank in Ireland. The grisly discovery was made at a home for unwed mothers in Yom, located in Galloway County. St. Mary's Mother and Baby Home was operated by Bon Secures Nuns between the years of 1925 and 1961. Examination of the bodies show most of the children died of disease and malnutrition. Others perished from diseases such as measles, pneumonia, and tuberculosis. The dead children were buried in simple shrouds with no coffin or tombstone to mark their final resting place. Today, the mass grave is surrounded by a housing unit, and due to the nature of the discovery, authorities may order the site to be exhumed. A source close to the investigation said, quote, God knows who else is in the grave. It's been lying there for years, and no one knows the full extent or total of bodies down there. And, you know, the thousands of reports worldwide that similar things have been happening. One of them between uh, a convent and somewhere a priest stayed. Such was the conviction of hundreds of thousands of Christians throughout history who were burned at the stake for refusing to participate in the sacrifice of the Mass which they earnestly believed was the greatest abomination conceivable. Why? Because it claims to be the literal sacrificial offering presented again and again of the body and blood of Christ. Whereas the Bible clearly states that Christ's sacrifice upon the cross was completed once and for all, never to be repeated again. Quote, well, yeah, I think we know why these uh, people didn't take part in the Mass, because they probably understood Latin, and they knew just by the very presence of these pagan priests, and the fact that they worshipped other deities, and, and the names of other deities, which we've gone over in this video. Um, you know, this is the scripture that speaks about the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, um, that yes, when you, you drink the wine, you should remember that the blood that, that Yeshua shed for us and broke his body for us. Uh, yes, we should remember him, but we should be born again first, um, crying out to him for mercy and forgiveness. We don't need to confess every single little sin, but we must uh, call out to him, um, admitting that we are sinners and asking him into our life to be our Lord and Saviour. Um, that's what the basis of Protestant Christianity is and in doing this to the Lord's Supper we can uh, be strengthened in the fact that we can examine ourselves as it says here in verse 28 and so let him eat of the bread and let him drink of the cup but let your examine yourself first you know if you've been lying if you've been stealing these are not the things of God you must um, repent about these things before you take the, the body of Christ uh, but not to a Catholic priest but to the high priest as it says in Hebrews um, I believe it says it in Hebrews let's have a look at that Hebrews 9 and uh Christ having appeared as a high priest of the coming good things through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, this is not of this creation, nor through the blood of goats or of calves, but through his own blood he entered once and for all into the Holy of Holies, having procured everlasting redemption. So again it's speaking about purifying our conscience from dead works lies, stealing, trying to build your own empire up um, is not acceptable before God. Met so many Christians that, that do these things and they even excuse themselves. If they think that they have been wronged, they start to wrong other people as well and, and say, well, it's okay to do that. It's not okay. 
So Yeshua is the high priest and he is the mediator of the new covenant. And when Yeshua said, this is my body, and this is my blood, you know, drink and eat in remembrance of me. Yes, it's a type of transubstantiation, but it's not the way the Catholic Church does it. And it's certainly um, not naming other gods, which uh, even the Torah is against naming other gods. So there's no way we should name fallen angels when we're actually remembering the Messiah, as the Catholic Church in fact does. So this is the reason why these martyrs would not take part in the Catholic Mass. They'd rather die than take part in that abomination. Thank you for watching.